Hello and a very warm welcome to the World Economic Forum DW debate coming to you from Nepi Dao, the capital of Myanmar. Who would have thought just a year ago that we'd be all gathered here in this country on the threshold of great change? A country which is currently facing huge problems but also hopes to be part of the success story of Southeast Asia. Now, economic prospects in Southeast Asia remain extremely bright, but we also know now that lack of proper infrastructure is a big drag on growth, which could be even higher and more inclusive. So what do we need to do to power growth through strategic infrastructure? What actions, what innovations do we need to realize the full economic potential of Southeast Asia? To discuss that, we have a distinguished panelist for you here, starting with Stephen P. Groff, who is the Vice President of the Asian Development Bank based in Manila. Shahril Shamsuddin, President and Group CEO of Sapura Kanchana Petroleum from Malaysia. Hamish Turwit, Chief Executive Officer, Leighton Holdings, based in Australia. John Rice, Vice Chairman, GE Hong Kong, who's also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum East Asia. And Geeta Vijewan, the Minister of Trade from Indonesia. A warm welcome to all of you. Now, you could give them a hand, of course. <laughs> Right, Stephen, let me start with you. Now, you have a very broad overview of the region through your work with the Asian Development Bank, especially in infrastructure. What do you think needs, uh, uh, what are the infrastructure needs in your assessment of this region to unleash its full economic potential? Well, Amrita, first, thanks for having me here today. I mean, I, I think we all know that the, the needs of the region are huge. Our estimates for developing Asia are the needs are somewhere on the order of about $750 billion a year between now and 2020. Um, so those are huge, and those are a range of different infrastructure areas, such as transport and uh, communications and energy supply. Um, but the other part of it, of course, is that we need to see interconnectedness between Southeast Asian countries in particular increasing. And right now, the connections, the transport connections, the telecommunication connections, the energy, energy supply connections between countries in Southeast Asia are, are, are insufficient to meet the kind of, of demand, to meet the kind of growth rates that we want to see propelling the region through for the coming decades. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, John, your company, GE, has been involved in ASEAN for over 100 years. How important is the role of the private sector in unleashing the potential of this region through investments in infrastructure? Well, I think it's very important. I think when you look at the challenge of providing infrastructure for a growing population, a growing middle class that really wants better things, you need, you need private companies and the technology they bring. You need, you need private capital. And then you need capacity and capability creation. I mean, you have to be able to, to train people and help them become better leaders. And it's really the kind of things that you do for a country that we would do in GE for our own people. Right. Now, obviously, um, uh, Hamish, your company is an engineering and uh, a company which has been involved in infrastructure in Asia for several decades. You're also a member of the World Economic Forum's Infrastructure Steering Committee. What areas would you highlight in infrastructure development which are key for the region? I think the first thing is to understand why, what was that uh, committee formed for and why. And if you look at the uh, the major challenges that have taken place post the GFC really is that the burden of, uh, of rolling out infrastructure or the responsibility of rolling out infrastructure cannot rest just with governments alone. Uh, various fiscal constraints mean that the, you know, we've seen a huge shortfall and the global shortfall of infrastructure development is around about $1 trillion. So at the World Economic Forum, the Board of Governors and the infrastructure sector has really been working on, on trying to unlock uh, the issues that are, that are causing that deficit. So we're looking at prioritising projects, we're looking at uh, better allocation of risks between the public and private sector, and, and finally, how do we access you know, this huge uh, amount of uh, private uh, funding that is out there and, and really bringing that public-private partnership uh, together to, to fund this infrastructure deficit. Thank you. Um, Sharil, now you are, um, 
the owner of one of the biggest companies, uh, oil and gas uh, integrated services companies based in Malaysia. Do you think that energy is the biggest infrastructure issue facing the region? And if so, what needs to be addressed most urgently? Um, I, would, I would echo to say it is, it is a very critical component of development. Because energy will drive all the other developments that, that, that is required. And, and it's not just one, just energy, but the, the interlink and the dynamic that goes on the different components as transport, education, uh, security, and a, and a strong uh, legal infrastructure. Because if, when, when all of this comes together, then, then you will also attract investment into, into the region. And um, one of the things that we have to be mindful about this area is that you know, different countries are at, at different levels of development. Um, I would propose a joint development on infrastructure itself because that will be eff effective use, use of capital. Uh, at the same time, I would also like to underscore the point that in, in, in developing any of these facets, especially energy, it's also an opportunity to build capabilities locally. I think uh, John mentioned about capability building and building a middle class. Uh, this, these projects are huge. It's an opportunity to train capabilities uh, to grow the middle class in this area, which is on the demand side of whatever is produced after the energy and the transport and telecommunications. Um, without, without the development of both in tandem, you may disintermediate uh, uh, certain, certain classes of people and, and it will not be a sustainable. So I guess I would add to, add, add to that will be a prudent, prudent policy that encourages all of, uh, all of this to happen in tandem. Thank you, Sharil. Um, Gita, most of the big infrastructure projects in, uh, in the world, or particularly in Asia, are in the hands of the government. What kind of actions and innovations can the government actually take or make to make infrastructure uh, more effective in this region? Well, I think, uh, let me speak with, uh, on behalf of ASEAN. We take a look at ASEAN on the yardstick of just about everything in the infrastructure play whether it's the degree of electrification, the number of kilometers of roads on a per thousand persons basis, number of kilometers of railroads on a per thousand person basis, and the telephony and all that. ASEAN sort of like rings SUP vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, our friends in other parts of Asia, uh, per, well, not to mention the OECD countries. We've, we've got our work cut out. And I think the view taking going forward ought to be with respect to the government's will or political will, rather, uh, and, and that has to be backed by a very strong fiscal fiscal space. Uh, the rule of thumb is, you know, for every dollar that needs to be spent on any infrastructure project, uh, the government should be spending a quarter to a third of that, and the rest uh, should be by the private uh, hands. And but the private hands are not going to be participatory if uh, the government is not going to be doing anything about it. Uh, now, the good news is ASEAN, I think, has a pretty robust fiscal space. I can speak for Indonesia, uh, a country that runs on a debt-to-GDP ratio of 23 to 24 percent. It's got money to spend now. Uh, but, you know, for about 25 to 30 years, there has been a regulatory hurdle, and that was basically the absence of the land law. And finally, the land law came out uh, almost two years ago, and the presidential decree that basically would detail out some of the stuff that needs to be involved in clearing land and all that uh, is out uh, just, uh, you know, about last year. Uh, I, I think we can expect to see some quite significant unleashing uh, of infrastructure development uh, by way of our having the necessary regulatory framework, the political will, you know, probably not as ideal as we would like it to be, and also the fiscal space. But no. are the governments in uh, uh, Southeast Asia spending enough of infrastru on infrastructure? Because you were spending Indonesia about three and a half percent of GDP, which you intended to raise Long to time ago. eleven percent yeah. this year. Yeah. Uh, but are they spending enough? Because the average spend in Southeast Asia by governments on infrastructure is below the Asian average. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, like whatever yardstick that I've mentioned, not only the portrait of where we are vis-a-vis -vis all the other countries in Asia, but what we're spending mm -hmm. is not as high as where it should be. Take a look at Indonesia, uh, more particularly. Our, our logistics uh, to GDP uh, ratio is the highest in the world vis-a-vis -vis some of the more developed uh, economies in Asia. Mm -hmm. 
uh, much less the you know developed economies around the world. Uh, I think it, it, it's around the range of 20 percent uh, in terms of the cost of logistics, and that is attributable to the fact that the infrastructure is just not adequate. We've got to spend a lot more, mm -hmm. and I think we can't just be thinking of the tens of billions. We've got to think of the hundreds of billions, if not the trillions, in the next 10 to 20 years. The question is, are we going to have enough fiscal space? And the answer is, we do. Now, I think with that space, given enough political will, given the right uh, regulatory framework, I think we can start getting things moving uh, the right uh, direction uh, more so than ever. Hamish, do you think there is enough fiscal space? Because what uh, statistics show that actually the m amount of money spent on infrastructure lending projects last year declined by about 6.3 percent. I don't think the, the constraint is, uh, is, is lack of liquidity or the fiscal constraint. I think the, uh, the issue is the risk allocation and, and you know, this, if we call it this public-private partnership, you know, how do we actually develop a model uh, that, out, that deals with all the risk across all the different sectors mm -hmm. to give the certainty uh, you know, to the investors to get their return over a sustainable period. And everything we're talking about here is not one or two years. We're, all of us have mentioned decades and a very long-term vision uh, towards a sustainable, productive future. So for me, the, you know, the key is, is really the model, is an equitable model uh, that, that shares the appropriate uh, levels of return and risk between public and private partnerships. John, is that something you can uh, agree with, that it, risk is the problem, the distribution of risk? And is there only kind of one kind of model in private-public partnerships, or what would you...? Uh... Well, I, th I think public-private partnership is, is a term that people tend to define a, l a little bit differently. Uh, at its heart, though, I think you have to assume that if you're going to attract private capital, to invest in a, in a public infrastructure project, you have to be prepared to deliver the investors a certain return. And for a public company, it's roughly equivalent or over the weighted cost of capital. And if you, and if you can't do that, then you're gonna, not going to attract much private capital because that capital's got to go where the shareholders think that they can get a reasonable risk-adjusted return. And so it, it really starts with that premise. And I think if you can solve for that, then you have companies like ours and others that are pre quite prepared to do business around the world, uh, even in places where you might see a higher risk, because it's a business we understand, it's with partners that we know, so we take a different view of the strategy behind the decision. But, but you've got to really wrestle with the fundamental question is can you, can you give a return, provide a return that allows the private capital a reasonable risk-adjusted return? Sharil, you, uh, what has your experience been? I, I, I would like to echo what, what he said, but I'll give an example. Yeah? Mm. If, if you look in Malaysia, uh, the development of marginal oil fields mm. uh, where we were able to fund it, yeah, we were able to fund it by, by the banks, basically. We were able to raise a bond based on the, the certainty of hydrocarbons in the ground mm -hmm. and that the project will yield a certain return. Without, without again, without a, uh, knowing that you will get a, that yield, you will not get the financing. So in that way, uh, the policy was to allow uh, a, some sort of a cap. I mean, the... the the risk is, is guaranteed by the company, and the banks were willing to accept uh, the risk because the company was in a consortium that, was, that had track record of developing these fields before. Uh, the subsurface was studied by an independent uh, company which was endorsed, and that risk was internalized by, by the financiers, and the financiers then gave us the money to, to develop uh, the project of now almost a billion over dollars. So, again, it's the legal infrastructure, the way, the way you, would, you would find innovative ways of financing those kind of projects through, through uh, non-traditional uh, uh, approaches to, to the securing of risk. Stephen, uh, everybody's talked about some of the kind of, uh, there's cheap money available for infrastructure projects. There's a need for infrastructure development. From your experience, 
is it actually just the lack of finances which is impeding infrastructure development or is it the non-financial hurdles which are much more important like the regulatory fr uh, framework, the legal framework that you talked about and multiple layers of governance in countries like Indonesia? The, the short answer to the question is yes. Um, you know, I think that the challenge that the region faces is is one of it's, it's one of this risk point that John has has made, um, but it's also a lack of instruments for intermediating the excess savings that exists within the region. And we refer to this as the, the the infrastructure financing paradox that exists within Asia broadly, but specifically within ASEAN. I mean, ASEAN right now you have some 700 billion dollars of foreign exchange reserves, and you have an unmet demand of 60 billion dollars of infrastructure just in ASEAN alone. Um, so unless we can figure out instruments and mechanisms for, for leveraging against that, those, uh, those excess savings, right now those excess savings are invested in low-yielding treasury securities in the Eurozone and in the United States. So we need to figure out ways that you can leverage that money, much as the other panelists have said, to make investments at, you know, appropriately risk-assessed uh, investments in, in the region. Uh, Gita, do you think the governments are doing enough and have they got it right? Because when you no. choose an infrastructure project in which you want to invest, what is your primary motive? Is it actually to gain revenue or is it to actually job creation or no, to help the maximum number of people benefit from it? We're, we're not in a government to gain revenue. We're in a government to serve the public, right? Uh, <laughs> that's a politician's I'm, comment. That's what, they, that's what they call me, the public servant. <laughs> But look, you know, you've got ASEAN with around 10 kilometers of roads on a per thousand person basis, about 0.25 kilometers of railroads on a per thousand persons basis, about 75 to 76 percent electri electrification rate, relatively good quality of water availability. Uh, telephony, you know, the fixed line yardstick is not. I think uh, accurate in you know giving the right picture because of the mobile telephony, and that has allowed us to circumvent the impediment. Now, I'm not a proponent of the argument that you know uh, the money is an issue, but the fiscal space is an issue. I've never been worried about whether or not there's enough money out there to fund the building of roads, railroads, ports, and airports, and power generation capabilities. But the private guys are not going to go in if they don't see the government getting its act together. Now, the, the government, government has made a couple of mistakes in Indonesia. You've had this swanky well, new Well, that's, that's probably an understatement, but, you yeah. know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> but, look, I think the view forward is that we have recognized what our shortcomings have been, and the important thing is directionality. You know, guys like John and Sharil, and Steve and Hamish are not going to look at Indonesia if there is no macro political stability, if there is no macro economic stability. Mm -hmm. And I think we can check off those two boxes today, tomorrow, and a few years thereafter. The ratings are improving, mm -hmm. and all we've got to do is just, is, is, is just that we've got to put money on the table from the government. For a long time, we didn't. We didn't have that ability because we were indebted uh, significantly. We have trimmed down our debt. Now we can start thinking, okay, let's put more money into education. Let's put more money into infrastructure. Before, when we started having more money, we couldn't do it as easily because the regulatory framework was not ready. Now it is more ready than ever because the land law is out. It tells and defines the extent to which or how long you're going to have to wait to clear land and how much you've got to pay. That's a defining moment, not only for the government, but hopefully for the private sector. Now, all the stuff that John and the other guys have to do is just wait. Okay, this guy's been talking, but is he putting money to work? Exactly. If, That's what I want to ask If then. in a year or two we would have built better airports or more yeah. airports, yeah. ports, and power generation yeah. capabilities, I'm quite sure the money will come because there's tons of liquidity out there. Yeah, but there. when? That's the question. So I want to well, put this question Well, you know, again, to coming from ASEAN, yeah. you know, I'm a student of gradualism. Yeah. We've just got to be patient. <laughs> you see, the time is running out, uh, and so we have to find out. I'm going to ask John. Indonesia is obviously making a, quite a bit of an effort from what the minister says. Yep. Uh, is the story of Indonesia replicated across Southeast Asia? Are governments doing enough in terms of infrastructure regulation, in terms of land, uh, uncertain land rights? And I, 
I don't really know how to define enough, but governments are doing more. And I think the, the point that Gita made, more and more governments understand, it's complicated. There are trade-offs that go with all of this. I mean, economic development, infrastructure development doesn't come for free, right? And it doesn't come without making trade-offs. You have to choose you have to make choices about power sources. You have to make choices about transportation. You have to relocate people to build new roads and, and, uh, and railroads. And that comes at a little bit of a price. But that is the conversation going in the right direction. I think, I think it absolutely is. But because um, Amrita, if I may just add, okay? Yeah. Almost a couple of years ago, John and I were having a drink in Honolulu. He was just boggled and balked by how slow things were. Mm. And I told him to be patient. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Value unleashed a couple of months thereafter. And guys like GE and the big companies around here, they get the big picture. And mm -hmm. all they want to see is directionality. Right. And I think Indonesia has been able to prove directionality. I, I think that's exactly right. And we're not, we're not looking for risk-free investments. Mm -hmm. We're looking for reasonable clarity, a level playing field, and a stable governance structure. We understand as an investor you have to take risks. So it's not about that at all. It's about exactly the points that, that Gita made. And when we see that, we are prepared to invest, and we're doing that in, e in Indonesia and other countries in Southeast Asia. Well, one of the risks the region does face is actually uh, the lack of adequate electricity or what they call energy poverty. Um, Sharil, if you want to kind of add your comments on that, um, by 2015, the ASEAN economic community is supposed to come in place. Energy integration is an important element of that. Um, how far have they got there? I, I think the, the conversation is, is progressing well. Again, you know, I'll, I have to underscore the, the issue of trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Different countries are at different levels of development. Mm -hmm. And uh, prudent use of policy to drive mm -hmm. Uh, the delivery of energy to the right to the right place and the transportation of energy to the right uh, to the demand where, where it's at is, is, is a complex one you know uh, if you were just to use a, a straight line capitalistic model you'd say just let's send it where the demand is but you do have to send energy to where the demand is not yet and to ensure that, that those areas come up Mm. Because in the end of the day, if you stretch a time frame around 30 years, those are the areas that are going to need that energy. So you have to start now. So, so you need to have a longer-term view on this. And not, it's not a, a three-year, five-year. It's more of 15 to 25 years. This area is probably going to be, some of the figures I see, maybe 44% of, of the world's GDP in 25 years. But ASEAN has set itself a deadline, and that's one of the deadlines is 2015, and the other deadline is 2020 for an integrated energy system. Stephen, how much work needs to be done? We heard from Shahril, it's not an easy solution, long-term planning. But do you mean to say they will not then be able to reach the target they've set themselves for 2020? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're not going to meet the target, but I think there's a lot of challenges ahead. I think you look at, uh, you look even beyond that, and aggregate energy demand is expected to increase in the region between three to five percent on an annual basis. So there's, there's, there's meeting that, de meeting that demand, creating the interconnectedness that's necessary in order to meet that demand on a sustainable basis. But there's other questions of, as you see that kind of increases, what is the sustainable energy mix that we can put in place? And right now, if you, if we, if we stay with the mix that we have, coal uh, dependency is going to increase by f more than 50 percent during that same time frame. So we need to be looking at the demand side, we need to be looking at the supply side, and making sure that we're making investments that are going to be sustainable in the long run. I'm not saying in any way that coal isn't going to be part of the solution. It will be part of the solution. But we need to be looking at, at addressing uh, energy efficiency. We need to be looking at, 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 at sustainable uh, sources of, of generation as well. And Hamish, I mean, at the moment, I think 74% of the energy in Southeast Asia is derived from fossil fuels. What could a new energy mix look like in this region? I don't think it's um, too much what a new energy mix should look like. I, you know, I look at uh, obviously the huge uh, supply that's coming on board with LNG uh, and thermal coal, and I think the base load in this region it's appropriate that it comes from the fossil fuels at this stage and. As new technologies come in, you know, with GE, we're doing a wind farm in Mongolia at the moment. Mm. We're doing them in Australia. Um, it's getting the, the mix right, but we really need to focus on the base load at the moment. Energy is 
you know, is the, is, is the, the foundation of, of infrastructure, it, it, what, uh, it what stimulates infrastructure. And we're seeing this huge move of urbanisation through the whole region is just going to increase the energy demand. So whether that's 50% or 100%, the reality is that it, it can be met with today's technology. In fact, um, yeah, uh, GE is very involved in uh, providing some of the solutions in Myanmar, where we are now. 74% of the people have no electricity, right. and 84 in the rural areas. And, and I think, to the point that mm. Jiro made and others, it's the fundamental building block for, mm. for a standard of living change and economic development. You can, if, if, you're, if a nice road passes in front of your house but you don't have electricity, you don't care so much about the nice road, right? You, mm -hmm. you can't do much without electricity in terms of reaching all the people. So for a company like ours, we've, we've had to reshape how we think about, about power generation and look at much smaller, more distributed methods because we know that the grid won't get everywhere it needs to go and reach all the people it needs to reach. And I think all of the companies that are attending this, this economic forum have, to, have had to alter their view about how to deliver products and technology and capability in places where there are basic needs to be met. Sharil, how can the basic needs be met from your perspective in a country like Myanmar, where the poor have absolutely no access, the rural poor to energy, the urban poor uh, have very limited access to energy. We take certain things for granted in the Western world. You press a switch and the light comes on. You know, you turn a tap on and there's water. But these are things which are completely uncertain here in this country. Well, you know, not just this country, but all countries that are similar. Yeah, even Malaysia at one point. I mean, there are resources. Yeah, and those resources will be extracted. As I mentioned before, you know, in the extraction of those resources for energy, there's, there's opportunities for capacity building also. And again, no, th those resources will also be exported and some of the revenues coming from those resources will have to fund social projects. Because at the end of the day, uh, you have hydrocarbons in the ground that belongs to the country. It's, some of it has got to come to development of social infrastructures. I mean, there's no other way. That, I mean, the equation is quite fixed. Stephen, I want to just uh, stick with uh, Myanmar for a bit. I mean, you know, we are on this kind of uh, moment in, in the country when it's opening up to the world. There has been a lot of uh, investment interest in Myanmar. But uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, the leader of the opposition, warned against a frenzy of uh, investments and talked about uh, the need to be a little more cautious in the kind of development that uh, Burma, Burmese uh, leaders decide to go in for. What is your assessment of the situation? Well, I, I, think, that's, I think that's essentially correct. I mean, I, one, thing, one, of, one, of, one of my greatest concerns about, about development in Myanmar is there's a lot of challenges, and we know, those, we know those well. They've been articulated by many, including ourselves. But I think that the one great challenge for the countries is that of expectations management. Expectations mm -hmm. management both on the part of foreign investors, but expectation management perhaps even more importantly on the part of the people of Myanmar. Uh, you know, th there's huge expectations for dramatic and speedy change that are not going to be met. It's going to take time. I mean, there will be change. I'm completely convinced that the government is committed to this reform process, but it's going to take quite some time. And I think that this is why um, when we talk about resource extraction, it's critically important. Um, and I agree entirely with the fact that we need to be making investments side by side in, in, in social infrastructure, in, in, in off-grid uh, electricity supply, in, in education, and health. And if we don't see those investments in happening in Myanmar alongside resource, necessary resource extraction, you know, the, the, the future is not as bright as it might otherwise be. Now, Gita, we've seen that you, know, uh, you as, uh, as a politician, you, your country's been through various stages of development. There are other countries in this region, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. Um, they've also had to make changes. Looking at Myanmar, what would you wish for the country? What would you caution them against? And what would you say that they should need to do as they open up to the world? Well, actually, I, was, I, was, uh, I had a discussion with Aung San Suu Kyi uh, last year. And some of the stuff we talked about uh, related to the stuff that you've just observed. Uh, you know, until about a year and a half ago, I was the chairman of the investment board in Indonesia. And I was, I was very careful about not overselling, over-marketing Indonesia. Uh, 
Uh, and it's always useful to tell everybody from within and beyond uh, that, you know, there's still corruption in Indonesia. There's still bureaucratic deadweight in Indonesia. Uh, that we're not as educated as some of our brothers and sisters and friends in Singapore and Malaysia. But the important thing to note is that, is Indonesia going to be less corrupt five years from today or ten years from today? Is Indonesia going to be less bureaucratic? And, you know, I would encourage them to take a view. And, and the facts are that, you know, in 2009, FDI was only about six billion U.S., and last year, we had 25 billion U.S. dollars worth of FDI, and FDI has been growing at 25 to 30 percent. The fact remains that three to four years ago, the United States was not even in the top 15. Now they're in the top four. Uh, Korea was nowhere in the picture. Korea is now the second or th third largest investor in Indonesia. And the good news is they're putting money to stuff that matters in the long run. And that's not just coal mining, oil and gas, and all that good stuff. It's stuff that's being put into manufacturing, services, agriculture, and whatever that I think will help Indonesia move up the value chain. That's, I think, good news because it will help Indonesia move in the right direction. Well, India, uh, Indonesia is already moving in the right direction from what I can see, Gita. Yeah. You're very much the flavor of the year. And if I had my well, way, Well, I think I'd be, Myanmar I'm... is the flavor of the year. <laughs> that is true. Congrats to you know, our friends in Myanmar. At the international scale, I always think that you know, Indonesia is very kind of ready to join the BRICS, and I should be called BRICSI. Yeah. with Indonesia as the Well, I've, the I've, I've had my debates with Jim O'Neill, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. We, we, you know, let the others choose as to whether or not we belong to that group. Right. Uh, Hamish, I want to come back to you and ask you a little bit more about uh, what needs to be done, because, I mean, Connectivity is extremely important uh, for ASEAN. Uh, connectivity includes, obviously, physical infrastructure as well as the soft aspects of infrastructure. What needs to happen quickly that some of the aspirations of connectivity are met within, say, the, in the short term in the next couple of years? I think the, one of the key things is a vision. If I look at the success stories throughout uh, the region that have worked, and, and Malaysia had Vision 2020, and you know, you know, whether you agree with all of the, the projects and the path that it took, the reality is that it got Malaysia from a certain base to, in, to a position now where, you know, very soon it'll probably exceed its expectation of being a fully developed nation by 2020 and, and reach that ahead of program. And that was done by having a vision, then putting in place a consistent plan that was not linked to political tenure. And I think that's the, you know, the key. If, if you look at what's worked in the region, it's taking the political cycle out of a national vision and out of a regional vision. So anything that can be done to you know, coordinate a platform that is non-self-serving across the region for the benefit of all in the region towards a, a vision uh, that lasts the tenure of infrastructure, and we've all talked about this slow gestation of infrastructure, you know, 20, 30-year lifespans, you know, 50 years, it's not four or five years, which is a political cycle. Shai, let me just touch on one a subject which was raised, which is uh, they talked about you know, corruption. And there is a perception, of course, that uh, there is a fair bit of graft and uh, what is called cronyism in Asia, as well as corruption and kickbacks when it comes to large infrastructure projects. What has your experience been? You're a large player uh, we, in the region. We, yeah, we, we work from Brazil to, to, to New Zealand. And it's in, in Malaysia, of course, in Asia, and, and, and different perceptions of, of, of corruption in different places. But in reality, when you come to big infrastructure projects where, where there is funding from really important funding agencies, ADB or World Bank or, or just commercial banks, I think the, the, the way the projects are being evaluated Corruption has got a very small uh, uh, contribution to this, uh, if not at all. Because at the end of the day, it comes to the returns of those projects. And if there was, the returns won't be there. So I think some of this talk about corruption is really overrated and being perpetuated by certain quarters that, that uh, all these areas are corrupted. But in reality, I, I've not experienced it. Yeah, And um, in, in the ecosystem, where you have to work with NOCs, national oil companies, and, 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 and uh, independent oil companies, and oil majors, where evaluation of those projects itself 
is really transparent because it's in a PSC environment, production sharing environment, where technicalities of, of the job itself yeah, is within parties that are not connected to the government. There is no avenue to do that because you have to go down and, and win it on the base of your technical capabilities, and only that and goes to commercial. So I, I really feel it's, it's something that is propagated by certain quarters just because they didn't win the job. So we have to be very careful about, about this myth that there's so much corruption around. John, do you share that view? And I also want to ask you if there's one area of the PPP, a private-public partnership area, that needs a bit of work so that the targets uh, can be uh, reached more quickly, what would that be? Well, first of all, I totally agree with Cheryl's mm -hmm. point. We operate in 160 countries, and we, we worry about corruption everywhere. We don't worry about it any more in Southeast Asia than we do anywhere else in the world. We have our way of doing business, and we, and we walk away from deals that aren't conducted openly and transparently. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there is plenty of business to be had in Southeast Asia under those conditions. I, I want to touch briefly on a point that you made about the frenzy in Myanmar before ans answering your other question, because I, I think if it's a frenzy, it's not going to serve the, the nation well. And the government can't absorb a frenzy. The decisions can't be made if it's a frenzy. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure that it is a measured approach. I think the other point is that the, the government, this this fledgling democracy, 60 million people are waiting to see what, democ what benefits democracy will bring. And they have to see benefits. So there are going to be some trade-offs that have to be made because I don't know that they're going to wait five or ten years to see those benefits. They're going to need to see some benefits soon and some benefits over time. And I think all of the companies involved and all of the institutions involved in this process have to respect that fact. That will require trade-offs, too, the balance between short-term and long-term. And if we, we all get this right, the, there is no reason to think that the people of Myanmar can't benefit just the way people in other ASEAN countries have benefited from good governance, democracy, investments, and a better standard of living. Yeah, the important thing is, of course, is uh, responsible investments, because one of the things Aung San Suu Kyi said, that people are already getting impatient here, that it's in the third year of reform, and they're asking for basic infrastructure, basic things like roads, water, electricity, health, education. So you're right. It's also a problem about high expectations. Well, I think so, too. Let's face it, democracy is not perfect. Mm. There are democracies that have been around for hundreds of years that don't always operate the way people would like them to operate. I think you have to give a lot of credit to the amount of change that's taken place here mm -hmm. in a relatively short period of time. People without electricity want electricity, and if you don't have it, you're impatient. So I get that. But, but this has been tremendous progress in a, in a, in almost overnight in the context of democratic evolution. I'll ask, uh, uh, Stephen, uh, one of the talking about the frenzy, since that has become a bit of an issue here, apparently one of the ministers reportedly said that he's meeting so many international delegations of investors that he has no time to actually think about what he should be doing. What are they offering? What should I do? This, is this the person to invest in? Are you worried about that, that there is this kind of scramble uh, for a rich nation with poor people for resources here? I, no, I think that's exactly correct, and I and I would include you know ourselves as my as a representative of donor the donor community that that we contribute to the problem as well where we um, you know we I think suck up some of the bandwidth as far as the as the far as the ministries are concerned, and it's a challenge we've seen over and over again in in, in many emerging economies where where the capacity in the in the in, in in the government is very very limited, so the number of people that you can actually see that know what's going on is relatively limited. So I think that what we need to be doing collectively is exercising restraint, self-restraint, which we're not necessarily that good at, but it's you know, encouraging to hear John you know, emphasize the importance of that. 
Um, but also, I think, is finding ways that we can invest in building capacity within the government and within institutions in the, in the country so they can actually serve that demand. The demand's not going to go away, and there's going to be interest in this country for a long time to come. But the, getting over this hump in the immediate term is going to require restraint on the part of, of, of investors, restraint on the part of donors, but also us finding ways that we can help support the government in, in, in making these things happen over the short term. And of course, one of the very positive uh, elements is that all of you are emphasizing human capacity, which is also in terms of soft infrastructure. Hamish, would you agree that that is one of the critical areas that one needs to look at? We've, um, mm -hmm. we've never found mm -hmm. the human capacity <coughs> excuse me, the constraint to um, infrastructure. In Indonesia, for instance, we've got training schools in Balikpapan and Banjamaisen where we train our people and uh, that, that hasn't been the issue. In Mongolia, we've recently opened up a coal mine and the, the highest productivity we get from our machines is from a 19-year-old Mongolian operator. So, and that's anywhere in the world. So we have the ability to, to train people. Infrastructure requires a high skill level at the engineering level but a reasonably low skill, skill level on the building component. So we can, we can deal with that capacity once you uh, untap, you know, for me it's the prioritisation of, uh, of infrastructure which is, which is needed and, and actually making the commitment to starting it. There are very few projects that I've seen that haven't been delivered and, and look at the facilities that we're in here and, and the, you know, the communication and connectivity we've got. It can be, can be done. The human constraint is not the is not the, the problem. And do you think, on balance, the Asian governments have got this priorities, uh, their priorities right in targeting which kind of infrastructure uh, needs most investment uh, most quickly? I, I don't believe that, uh, that we've got it right anywhere. I think that's one of the largest challenges that we have, and, the, uh, and that doesn't just go to this region. I think it's, a, it's very complex. We're, be, we're becoming a global world, and it's no longer the decision of just a city Mm -hmm. a state or a nation. It's, we've got to look at connectivity, collaboration and need across the, the world. There's no point building a, a, a container ship or port here mm -hmm. if there's nothing on the receiving end. So I think it is about prioritisation and that's a, certainly that's a challenge element. for government. Yeah. Um, Gita, let me just ask you a final question before I start asking the audience to throw in questions. Um, ASEAN is a wonderful organisation. You work very well together. But there's also underlying surface, are they kind of, are you also competing with each other as countries when it comes to infrastructure? Because there has to be connectivity at an infrastructure level. You should so have attended no the session this morning. <laughs> okay. uh, look, earlier, you know, John and I were together with Kishore and a few other uh, prominent people. Uh, it, was, it was a fascinating discussion about where ASEAN is and how we're surviving. I, I think it's important to underline that we're, we're a different kind of union by way of history and legacy vis-a-vis -vis some of the other unions that we're seeing in you know, other parts of the world. Uh, and I, I think we're there to last. And lasting doesn't mean that we don't have to compete against each other. Uh, and there, there's a lot of spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. And by way of the meetings that we do, uh, as much as some guys or some member countries may not be able to check off some of the, the boxes. Uh, there, is, there is a great degree of respect and understanding. And we were talking about the ASEAN economic community earlier today. Uh, you know, we're not going to get to the idealism that we set out you know, in 2003. Uh, we're, there's going to be a few boxes that we're not going to be able to check off, but there's respect for everybody else. And that's, that's, I think, what's keeping us together, aside from the fact that it has been miraculous how we have turned out, you know, from a geopolitical, economic, and social and cultural standpoint. And I think it's going to last. Yes, Singapore is going to have to do whatever they have to do. Malaysia is going to have to do whatever they have to do. Indonesia has got to do whatever we've got to do. And I think the next 20 years, it's all about making sure that we've got the supply side of the equation ready. And it's these guys out here who can help us in terms of creating and availing the supply side. Thank you very much. I, I just want to add one point. Uh, it's, it's not just a frenzy in Myanmar. You know, I feel like I don't have time to think nowadays. <laughs> okay. And that's because I think you should be a Brixie. That's why. Now, um, I thank the, the panelists very much for their comments. Obviously, we couldn't raise all the issues that uh, we could have raised and wanted to raise, uh, but we have time constraints. Uh, may I now invite the audience to pose their questions? You would need to identify yourself, and if you have a question addressed to a particular panelist, if you could mention that. 
the gentleman there. If you would wait for the mic to come to you. Kit Bullock from Accenture Development Partnerships. There's been a lot of talk about PPPs and public-private partnerships here on infrastructure, very interesting conversation. But what about private-private partnerships? And I'm thinking particularly where you know, rural electrification meets agriculture meets telecoms. And is there an opportunity for the private companies to get together in a more integrated approach to drive both economic development but also the, the social development that, that, that me and Myanmar needs? You know, we, we have dozens of those around the, around the world with, with companies to develop uh, biomass gasification for distributed power and things like that, that there is a lot of private capital that's interested in finding a home in the right infrastructure projects, along with the public-private connection we saw before. I, I see no limit to that, frankly. Healthcare is another area where there's tremendous interest in investing in, in basic he health care capabilities because that's another measuring stick that people use to gauge whether their lives are getting better or not. I'd uh, just like to add that probably about 80% of our order book in Asia is actually uh, private to private. So, uh, you know, whether it's the mines that we're working on or, you know, casinos in, in Macau, the tourism sector, you know, bottling plants for Coca-Cola in Indonesia, factories for Caterpillar. So the bulk of the work that we do actually is, uh, is private investment uh, coming in. But where the deficit sits at the moment, which is what we've been focusing on, is harnessing this public-private partnership will fund the deficit. But also to I go would, uh, back to the point earlier about, about legal and regulatory frameworks and how critical those are in order to realize, whether it be PP public private partnerships or private-private partnerships, but also I think policy on the part of governments in, in terms of determining that this is indeed a priority and this is one thing they, that they want to align themselves behind. And so again, it, it, there's, there's much to be done. I'd echo that too. Going to new areas, we always try to, do, to work with, with companies that add value yeah, on a, on a private basis, on, on for example, in, in, in Brazil, we go in with, a, with, with Cidro, with, with another company to, to address that market. Uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, indeed, for development of oil fields, we are in with another company called Petrify. And, and, and you, know, you get a sharing of capital, a sharing of risk, and also the sharing of uh, uh, expertise and capabilities to execute the work, which gives the financiers the uh, confident, confidence to come in and fund those projects. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have a question there from a gentleman in the white shirt. Ingalawa. My name is Wu Wing Wu. I'm a member of parliament from Yebu constituency. Well, we are very proud to uh, host a forum like this and you are welcome to our, our country. What I would like to ask for is what would you like to uh, wish for our people, people of Myanmar, or any message that you want to give to us? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for welcoming us to your country. We're all very happy to be here. And I think this is a message maybe everyone can say a word. I, I, I don't mind starting. I, I think um, Indonesia could be one of the models you can take a look at. Uh, we democratized ourselves uh, 15 years ago. And, you know, consistent with uh, the words of our leadership to your leadership uh, here, uh, that one of the few things that made us uh, the way we've turned out uh, was, there, was that there was a military reform that took place before a real political reform. And that's, I think, the step that you guys are taking here already. And you can learn from not only our successes, but our mistakes. And, you know, we're only 15 years into the game, and there's more to come. Uh, but uh, definitely uh, Indonesia could be a model for you to take a look at. I, I would agree with that, and I think that there's a, there's a real advantage that Myanmar potentially has as a second mover, if you will, to look at the, both the positive stories and the negative stories from the region and, uh, and move ahead in that. And I think one thing I would underscore is just the importance of, 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 of equality and inclusiveness when it comes to growth. One thing that we've seen over the region over the last 20 years is we've seen you know, tremendous amounts of people moved out of poverty, but a lot of that has been in China. And so there's been a gap that's been growing between the rich and the poor across the region, 
and that is something that, 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 that foments social instability, it foments all sorts of different things that you don't want. So you need to be looking at both the top end of that growth, you have to be looking importantly at the bottom end of that growth as you move forward. I think the one thing for me is, is looking forward. You know, the, if you look back and you try to you know, reflect on the past and you, and you can't, um, you, you can never put that behind you, but the challenge will be to unite on a common vision for the good of the nation and, and, that's, uh, and, and then tap into all the lessons uh, learnt around the region because you're certainly not alone in the journey that you're taking and there's a lot of interest that you succeed. You know, my, my wish is that, that people will see the benefits of democracy, understand that there needs to be some trade-offs in order for those benefits to keep accruing, and that this process will continue to develop. And if you think about the Indonesia analogy, there were probably people 15 years ago who were predicting it might not work, it's not moving fast enough, you know, there isn't the right benefit being spread around, and those things get dealt with over time, and the tremendous success that that country has had is a perfect example of what can happen when people persevere. Shari? I'm a little bit cautious to, to recommend any cookie-cutter solutions for, for, for I guess, for, for the running of a country because every place is unique. And every place has their own issues that they have to deal with. Therefore, you know, look at all the systems that are available around and, and understand how those systems fit best to your own needs and your own pace of development. Um, again, I'd be very cautious to have benchmarks that are, that are put up there for, that are not relevant to, you, to yourselves because you are your own people and I think you should choose how you want to run your country, only you know better. But the elements are there, you know, as long as, as benefit goes to, to, to everyone that lives in that country, I'm sure you will sort, Myanmar will sort itself out in good time. If I may just add my little comment to that, and one is that I met a Myanmarese journalist yesterday and he said to me that, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity for us Myanmar has a lot to gain, but if things are not done properly, we have a lot to lose. So I think it is kind of really important to do it right at this point. Now we are running out of time, so uh, we'll have to make the questions kind of pretty brief and we'll just get one person to answer them instead of the whole panel, but this I think was an important question, so I wanted everyone to have their say. Uh, the gentleman there in the red tie, please. I, I make it short, but the, my try my best. So the, um, uh, the uh, local company in the energy sector. So the, uh, you all know about the electrical situation in Myanmar, and Myanmar is going through the uh, economic growth, and the, the, uh, the, now the, the, the we need a lot of uh, the lack of infrastructure, and energy is the, uh, the uh, like what you say, the foundation of the infrastructure. So if you look at the electric, electrical power side, so the, uh, currently uh, what we are having is the lacking of the, uh, the how to, the, 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 uh, sub, uh, the sufficient of the supply. So we have a problems in the power generation, we have a problems in the power distribution. So there is some kind of the innovation, uh, innovative measure is needed. So I especially like to uh, the ask this excellency, please share with uh, your experience in uh, how you solve this kind of problem how you, in, the, <laughs> in, in terms of the infrastructure, briefly. Thank you so much. Well, well the key is, uh for the, I think the private sector is very good in sizing up the who you know modeling uh, exercise, right? Uh, you know whom to partner with and size up the risks and return profile. You can partner with you know guys here or guys outside Myanmar, but you've got to size up the degree to which the government, uh, you know, can get its act together in terms of coming up with the right tariff regime, coming up with the necessary framework so that you can make money. Uh, without being able to make money, you're not going to do anything here. Uh, and second, uh, the government has got to have the fiscal space, which is why, you know, I'm not so sure, you know, is it better to democratize in good times or democratize in bad times? We democratize in bad times. And as such, we had to really trim down on just about everything. And we had to, well, we lost a few years 
but we have to start out from scratch on a few fronts. You are starting off at a different level from where, where we were starting off 15 years ago. Just make sure you don't over splurge. You spend wisely. Make sure the government spend wisely on the stuff that matters, that ensures that the climate for the private sector is conducive for you to make more money in the next 10 to 20 years. Thank you. In fact, you could perhaps later after the debate talk to uh, John Rice from GE because they also have some really kind of interesting ideas on uh, electricity and the smart grid and non-off-grid things. But I need to ask another couple of questions before we finish off. Um, there was uh, the gentleman there who was waiting. If we can have, what we'll do is we'll just ask a couple of questions and then take them, and then the gentleman here. Uh, can you bring the, please, the gentleman in the, in the suit? And then the next question we'll have is uh, the gentleman uh, here in the beige be, jacket. Yeah. I'll try to Thank be you. as succinct as possible. My Thank name is you. Jim Keith. I'm with a business consulting firm, McClarty Associates, and a retired diplomat. You got toward the end of the conversation to the hard part about the trade-off and the prioritizing and what that really means. Is it more important that a country like Myanmar gets it right, or is it more important that the region gets it right around the country? Thank you. Uh, uh. Uh, my name is Aung Kukur, uh, an economist of National League for Democracy for the Economic Committee. Yes, I would like to ask the expected inflation rate of uh, ADB. Uh, yes, uh, you are expected. Uh, ADB is expected inflation rate for Myanmar in the coming six months. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question and that's the end. Actually, we'll take two since there are two hands there. Quickly and quick short uh, questions, please. Uh, the gentleman there with gray hair and then the gentleman there in a white jacket. And that's it. That's the final questions we'll have. Thank you. Okay. My name is San it's from China Solar. So I have a question to uh, uh, Stefan uh, Graf. Um, in this Asia, uh, Asian area is actually the sunbed area. Um, but the uh, uh, electricity assessment rate is so low. That means the off-grid system would be a perfect solution. Of course, integration, in, interconnection is very important. And, uh, but maybe the energy mix could be go something air, uh, some different direction. And I know ADB did a lot to support for the off-grid system. Uh, you have a lot of experience. From your experience, what do you think they, this area could do something more, whether from private sector, from government, or from uh, finance institutions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And the gentleman in the white jacket. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a manager from the bank. You know, I, I, once I was work, involved also in the energy. And for, for banking sector, we also uh, request for wider participation from the international bank. If they really would like to see the development in Myanmar, the same thing. Uh, now you can say uh, we have uh, taken up the wrong strategy in the, let's say something like uh, we have committed all the, the sale of the, all our gas, you know, so uh, we're going to make a you know, short-term measure in order to, uh, you know, this uh, kind of measure for this. So right. only just very, uh, very, very, how you call it, <clears throat> very specific, uh, let's say, request to you is we, like GE, we all, we only need a short-term measure only. Yeah. For short-term measure, we only let you know how can do you all help out together from international right. cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have run out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm sorry to use my prerogative as a moderator to decide that uh, obviously energy is the big issue. So I'm just going to let Stephen answer briefly uh, one of the, uh, the topics on energy. And then we'll end with just one sentence from each of the panelists saying what they think is the key uh, takeaway they have taken from the session. So, Stephen. Okay. On, on energy, I think that the, the, the key challenge is there's no, there's no mix, predetermined mix that we would, we would suggest to the country. A lot of it is going to depend, I think, importantly on on fixing what you already have at the outset. I mean, the installed capacity is sufficient to meet current levels of demand, and yet you have brownouts in, in, in major urban centers across the country. And so part of it is going to be upgrading, including in getting efficiency going and, and, and putting in deferred maintenance. It's going to allow those plants to operate efficiently. New investment is, of course, critically important, getting the legal and, frame, re, legal and regulatory frameworks right to encourage private investment. The energy mix is going to, is, is going to evolve over time to, based on demand. I can answer the one question on inflation, which is our, our estimate is 3.5 percent uh, for this year. 
Uh, thank you very much. And now I'm going to invite each of the panelists to make one sentence as their key takeaway from this, <laughs> uh, uh, from this session. Starting with you, Shari. Well, it's, it's very refreshing to come to, come to uh, Myanmar and see that people are asking all the right questions. And we, we're talking about all the right topics today because these are the fundamentals of growth going forward. And um, I look forward to, do, to come to, to, to Myanmar more and also to invest because I know these, in, 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 in very short time you will see results. And uh, we have been doing business here for the past three years and it's been very encouraging. It's been very professional. So it's very encouraging. Thank you. I think it's important that we don't confuse the right trade-offs, the right policy, the right strategy with perfect. And I, I, I worry that there's this search for the perfect energy mix or the perfect policy or the perfect subsidy program. And, uh, you know, we do business in a lot of countries, and I don't see a lot of perfection out there. I think, I think you've got to try stuff. And you do more of what works and less of what doesn't, and you adjust and you stay flexible, and, and the program evolves. And I think that in Myanmar and a lot of other places, you, you got to be okay with that. If you're looking for perfection, I think this is the wrong world. John, <laughs> when my mother used the word trade off, it always meant doing something I didn't want to you do. Clean up your room. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trade off. John, John is always a realist. Uh, look, I, I think it's important for the people in the government of Myanmar uh, not to overspend and oversell. Uh, you know, make sure you spend the right amount on what's important for you in the long run. Uh, and, you know, the question on trade-offs, uh, I think it's quite simple. You know, you've got to make sure that you do what's right for the people of Myanmar as much as there is plurilateral, regional, and multilateral undertakings and discussions and negotiations that are ongoing that are going to put you in a corner. But, you know, you've got this benefit of being a member of the ASEAN community. And that's an opportunity and a forum for you to express, you know, where you are, where you want to be, and where you may not be able to, you know, fulfill the desires and aspirations of the other members. And I can tell you, you know, we have not been unrespectful of anybody within the community, and I think we'll treat it and look at it with great respect and understanding. That was a long sentence. Thank you, Gita. <laughs> Shorter than Shari's. Yeah. As uh, the minister said, respect, and, and what comes from respect is trust. So, you know, for me, out of today, it's, uh, it's about trust in the region, trust in the country. Uh, it's about vision. So every country needs a vision. Every country needs prioritisation. Uh, you know, of projects and initiatives and, and everything that you do should be checked against ultimately reaching that vision. And that's not just for a nation, you know, a country or even individually, it's also for the region. So that's, uh, you know, prioritisation and vision for me. Thank you. Stephen? Um, well, I think that, I think, I don't really have much to add to what's been said. I think that this is a, you know, it's a great moment for, for Myanmar. It's a real opportunity. I, I, I would, the only thing I would say in response to the question about ASEAN or Myanmar, I, I don't think it's zero sum. I think there are plenty of solutions out there that we can look to that benefit both ASEAN and benefit both Myanmar in the long run. Right, thank you, Stephen. Well, that brings us to the end of this uh, session. Powering growth through strategic infrastructure in Southeast Asia. That was the focus of the World Economic Forum DW debate coming to you from Nepitao, the political capital of Myanmar. I thank all the panelists for their great contributions. I thank the audience here for being attentive. And I thank all of you, whoever you are, wherever you may be, for being with us on this wonderful occasion. I had a great time. I hope you did too. Bye-bye. <laughs>